I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. Seth Godin, this is the second time you're on the James Altucher Show. Welcome and thanks once again. Well, I'm glad I didn't blow it so badly the first time that you're letting me do it again. No, not only did you not blow it, we only had a half hour last time, which obviously led to me having more questions. Like I kept thinking afterwards, oh, I should have asked about X, Y, and Z. So now I have the chance to ask about X, Y, and Z. Perfect. My three favorite letters in the alphabet. Well, A, A, B, and C are close ones too. And Q is good. But um, (laughs) you you just had a new book come out and you you had to come out in a very innovative way. What to do when it's your turn and it's always your turn. Um, And people can find it on yourturn.link. I didn't even know a dot link was a possible thing. Yours is the first website I ever went to like that. So uh, why don't why don't we just start off? The book just came out. People can get it at yourturn.link. They can't even get it on Amazon. What was your thinking behind the way you've released this book, and and maybe describe the book a little bit? Uh, the book is the most direct, brave testament I could come up with about what is holding us back. And I think what is holding us back is not access to tools or audience anymore. I think what's holding us back is the voice in our head that pushes us to be mediocre or that pushes us to hide. You know, and and, and Seth, I'm uh, Seth, I'm going to keep interrupting, so I hope you don't mind. But go ahead. do, Do you think that's always what's held us back? So, for instance, the Internet makes it seem like, oh, now's the perfect time to start anything. But like, as you point out, Isaac Asimov wrote 400 books on a typewriter well before the internet, uh, you know, there, there's always been things. It's always our own mind that initially holds us back before anything else. Well, you know, let's be clear. There are 4 billion people on earth who are all, who are held back by structural or uh, cultural barriers that prohibit them from achieving their goals. And so right now we're already talking about just a a third of the world that has this sort of access. But when I was coming up, if I wanted to get published, I had to send uh, something to a book publisher in New York and they had to pick me. And I got 800 rejection letters my first year as a book packager. Well, 
today you would get zero rejections from the middleman because there is no middleman. Right. Uh, it, that that in you know the 1850s or the 1950s, if you did not live in a city where there was an appropriate business that could hire you to do your craft, you could not do your craft. And today, if you want to be a craftsperson, a writer, a photographer, a freelancer, anything, it doesn't matter where you live. So the geographic things are falling away. Uh, some of the structural things are falling away. And, you know, you know, all we have to do is look at the fact that, for example, 80 million people have started a blog, but almost nobody has finished one. Almost nobody has kept at it for uh, months or years at a time. And there's nothing expensive about doing it. In most cases, it's free. So why don't people do it despite the fact that there are all these clear and obvious benefits, both psychological and commercial, to being seen and respected as someone who speaks up, as someone who shares? So you know, your, your career has been going on for a while and it's been incredibly successful. But one of the compass points in it is that you regularly and consistently share what you know. And there are plenty of other people who aren't succeeding who are afraid to share what they know. And it's not because there is a, a structural thing keeping them from sharing. Right. So, so it seems like people have kind of their go-to excuses. So sometimes they don't want to share what they know because they're hoarding what they know. Or sometimes they feel, even in today's day and age, they still don't have the right equipment to make a video or the right software to write a book. Like everybody kind of has their go-to excuses. And I sort of feel like the theme of not only what to do when it's your turn, but a lot of your uh, more recent books is the barrier now is totally in your head. That's right. And I find that really profound. And I, I don't think I'm boring people yet, but because I keep cutting closer to the bone. The, the profundity is that when we are forming who we become when we are teenagers, uh, this narrative in our head gets amplified by our teachers and sometimes by our parents and often by our friends. And so what we need to undo is at the very core of who we are as humans, because culturally we have had our brains polluted by a whole bunch of stuff that's just not true. Well, and and that and, that leads yeah, to please. That, that leads to two questions, and I, I apologize again for, for interrupting, but it, uh, it leads to two questions. You use the word polluted, and yet it wouldn't have quite – and I agree with you, but it wouldn't have really happened that way unless there were positive benefits to it as well. So, so the fact that maybe the majority of the people needed to be regimented in some way, I don't know. I'm just brainstorming why that could be that everything became so regimented for so long. Well, we, we know why, and I, and I wrote a, ma a free manifesto called Stop Stealing Dreams about this. The Industrial Age, starting in the 1800s, was the most profound change that has ever happened to this planet. The Industrial Age changed everything we own, everything we consume, how we talk, how we go to work every day, and it made billions of people rich. It was this engine of productivity and technology working in sync to mechanize and pave the earth. But in order to do it, you need a hierarchy, and the hierarchy involves uh, someone who owns the company, the factory, the institution, and everyone else who does what they are told. And that project, which took 50 years of training almost everyone on earth to do what they are told, was, had never been tried before, and it was an enormous success. And so we invented public school to train children to sit still long enough to work in a factory. That's its function. And I love that. And now that we are in this post-industrial age, it's all leftover. That's not what we are rewarding going forward. We don't say, give that person a raise. He's the most obedient person who's ever worked here. Well, I like how you refer to the difference between what we had as the industrial economy and what you call now the connection economy. So that the way, you know, what to do when it's your turn really is to connect with other people. And that's how you get rid of the, the scarcity implied by economy. Exactly. I, I think that's the most cogent way I've ever heard it explained. So, and so, so back to what I set out to do with the book, I... Unlike some people, 
I don't write books because it's what I do. I write books because I have no choice. And I had waited two years and pretty much thought I was done writing books because people would rather read a blog post uh, or listen to a podcast. And this book would not let go of me. And so I did it. And then the question is, all right, well, if you have this new format that isn't particularly friendly uh, in the bookstore because they don't know where to put it and it's not particularly appropriate uh, in an online store because you really need to hear about it or see it because it's in full color and feels like a magazine, how then to bring the book to the world? And what I decided was to invest everything in what I call horizontal publishing, meaning structure the whole operation so that you will almost certainly hear about it, not from Seth talking to James in a podcast, but from your friend Tim or your friend Sue or your friend Faith saying, you need to read this book, person to person, side to side, the way ideas spread today. So that's why I published it myself. That's why it's on its own website, because if you buy one, I accidentally ship you two, and if you buy three, I accidentally ship you five, because what are you going to do with the extra books? You're going to share them. I love that. And have you had uh, feedback from people who have shared and, and heard about you through the sharing of the book? Yeah, so I have some really cool data. Uh, the first thing that's so gratifying is there have been a couple spikes because those are the days that I blogged about it. But when there aren't spikes, week over week, sales are going up, not down. And that can only be happening because people are telling other people about it. And that's what the whole bet is. And then the other thing that I'm uh, finding is that I'm hearing from people who say, I didn't know you had a new book because they don't read the blog as closely as I write the blog. I didn't know you had a new book, but my friend gave it to me and I want to tell you blank. It's the best thing, whatever, whatever. And that is what, as an author, you know, that is what makes every author happy. Not yes. that Barnes & Noble gave you a, a big promotion, but that someone cared enough about the contents of a book to give it to someone else. You you mentioned earlier um, about, again, how we have to kind of unlearn all these things that we learned in order to basically know that it's okay for us to take our turn. How did you, like, what was going on in your head when you were a teenager that basically... Because you started taking your turn pretty early on, I would say, you know, even before you started Yo-Yo Dying, like when you were doing book packaging and so on. What what was going on in your life starting from an early point? Well, you know, I won the parent lottery. Uh, they raised free-range children and encouraged me from a very young age uh, to do things that other parents thought were foolish or reckless um, as like, long as they had at their heart. Like what? So, so, like what? Like um, what? So when I was 14, my dad uh, put me on a boat with this guy who needed to take uh, uh, his boat from Buffalo to Detroit. It's a very long story, but the short version is at uh, midnight on Sunday, he uh, abandoned me in downtown Cleveland, uh, <laughs> seasick with no money to get on the subway in 1974 to find my way to the airport. And, you know, it was... I did this all by myself, no cell phones, no support, got to the airport, called my parents, told them I was at the Hilton and I had $10 left. The next morning, my mom calls me, wakes me up at 6 and says, you're in Cleveland because I had forgotten to say that I was in Cleveland. She thought I was in Detroit where I was supposed to be. Got home at 10 in the morning, right, having not slept or eaten in two days, covered with seasickness. Uh, My mom picks me up at the airport, gives me a change of clothes and says, we're going to school. Because I wasn't sick. I had just had an adventure, that's all. You don't take a day off because you're recovering from an adventure. Were you, and, uh, were you sad yeah. or, or scared? or like What was going through your head at that moment like when you saw your mom? Oh, I was, uh, did not feel anything weird had happened when she said I was going to school. That her belief that life was an adventure was something that I had been taught from an early age, and this was just consistent with that. Right? I never felt like I was never going to be able to return home. I grew up with enough of a foundation of, of safety and support that I knew I'd figure it out. But the key thing is that raising kids to figure things out is a choice. And today, just as then, most kids are not raised that way. They are raised to freeze 
to ask for help, to ask for permission. Uh, well, so I, what, yeah, what were your friends like who, who – like did you have like-minded pals in high school who were thinking the same way or – like you said, you won the parent lottery. I think that's relatively rare to have that sense of, of life as an adventure so early. Yeah, it was. And the cost of it was I didn't have a great number of friends because the way you're supposed to be friends with people in high school is by fitting in more than everybody else. And it's very fortunate for me that they invented the internet and all the things that came with it because if we were living in an industrial age, I would be uh, not considered particularly successful. And so what's happened is the tables have turned and all the people who would have said to me 40 years ago, you would do better if you would just fit in more, need to be told, you would do better if you would just stand out more. So, so, so again, like... I love this idea that life is an adventure because I think that is almost having that emotional ability to think that way allows you to take your turn and to realize that it's always your turn, which is, you know, of course, what your book is about. But it's also been kind of the theme of your writing all along. But I've seen and tell me if I'm wrong, I've seen an evolution in your writing in the past 17 books from a more marketing organizational oriented like how you can stand out as either an individual in an organization or as a uh, business you know sort of the purple purple cow approach to now where it's very personal that now is the time where I have to go out and become an artist and make my my stamp on the world my unique stamp on the world as opposed to my organization or brand's unique stamp on the world well you know Several things changed at the same time, and I was lucky enough to be part of this. Uh, when I wrote my first uh, marketing bestseller in 1999, uh, you needed to talk, spend a lot of time talking about tactics and techniques. That permission marketing was a radical idea that got me thrown out of the Direct Marketing Association. Huh. And so I would talk about how everything is marketing as opposed to advertising being marketing and do these talks that I do. And inevitably, the questions that people would ask were not, how do I change the headline to increase the open rate of an email? The questions that people would ask would be things like, I want to build a purple cow, but my boss won't let me. Or the question they would ask is, why is that little tiny company kicking our butt? Because for 80 years, we've been the market leader. And so the answer to the questions were, Marketing is personal, business is personal, and marketing is everything. And the reason your marketing is stuck is not because you don't know how to make a tweet that works. Your marketing is stuck because you're afraid. And so once that evolution was happening, not just in my work, but all around us, it seemed inevitable to me that the most important thing I could do was not share a tactic, but instead encourage people to become thirsty enough to go figure out what the tactic is but they're not going to do that if they're afraid. What, what's like an example tactic from back then that, that you were able to, let's say, teach an organization about? All right, so in Unleash the Idea Virus, uh, uh, which a book that I gave away for free, uh, it was the most popular ebook of its kind when I did it. Three million people downloaded it in the first few months. Hmm. Uh, I talked about the technique of, for example, making the ebook free. And including a link that made it easy to email to other people. Those are tactics. But even though it worked so dramatically well, changing the arc of my career, spreading an idea to people, improving uh, the trust and relationship I had with millions of people, almost no one who does what I do copied me for five years. And they didn't hesitate to copy me because they didn't know how. I told them exactly how and I showed them out loud. People didn't copy me because they were afraid because it was easier to go back to Random House and get picked one more time. Uh, And the people in the book industry didn't copy me because they decided it was easier on their watch to ride out the book publishing thing as opposed to uh, push it to change faster. And so that fear, that hesitation, that bureaucratic hesitancy to say, I made this, it might not work is what has slowed so much of the cultural change that's getting done by around the edges, but not in the center. 
I think I think this is it could be at that point really where your writing started to take a more uh, personal focus, not not personal on you, so to speak, but but personal on the reader. So so for instance, even the guy who says I'd like to do this, but my boss won't let me, he's afraid of his boss. He could still figure out ways to do it. My guess is in most cases. But there's still some kind of fear factor that's happening there. Exactly. The answer to the question is, well, you're going to your boss and saying to her, I want to do this radical new thing. And if it works, I get the credit. But if it doesn't work because you gave me permission, you get the blame. And if you say that to your boss, why on earth would she say yes? Right. And the, the way that change happens in organizations is when people take the blame but give away the credit. And if you do small things and every time they work, give credit to your boss, and every time they don't work, take the blame, A, you're not going to get fired, and B, there's going to be a line out the door of people who want you to do the next thing because that's what everyone's looking for. So when people say my boss won't let me, what they're actually saying is my boss won't let me off the hook. And that's a totally different sentence. I I always find in situations like that, and look, I'm always in favor of – people looking for entrepreneurship and ways to start their own businesses and, you know, ways to pick themselves, as you call it. But I always encourage people who are employees to to never hoard credit, like always give credit to your boss, because that will just reflect well on you and allow you to do whatever you want within the organization. You could be an entrepreneur within your organization. And I think that's a way to get around that fear. Oh, absolutely. You, you nailed it. So, so uh, what are things, and, and a lot of this is also related to kind of teaching people how to get out of their comfort zone. So, you know, and, and, that's, and that's how you take your turn when everyone has told you not to take your turn. So what are some things and some examples people can do to get out of their comfort zone, even if they want to just practice it? Here is the most important concept, and, and you have... Uh, a Cerebo audience, so I'm going to go straight to the conceptual way to think about this. Go for it. If you believe that your job is to avoid fear, then staying in your comfort zone is a brilliant strategy because it is the best way to avoid fear. On the other hand, if you believe that the thing you are going to get paid for is exposing yourself to fear, that putting yourself in a place where others and you are afraid, then that's your job. And once you get that, then you will seek out ways to get out of your comfort zone without an asterisk next to them, which is, how do I get out of my comfort zone without feeling fear? That's like saying, how do I run the Boston Marathon without getting tired? Right, but... No no one who runs the Boston Marathon asks that question. Right, but... I would say someone who runs the Boston Marathon has spent years practicing. First, they ran a mile, then two miles, and three miles. People don't really know where their where their fear factor is. How do they how do they practice kind of finding where their wall of fear is, or or, or going beyond that wall of fear? Right. So, in fact, there's this huge fog of denial around what you just said, and I'm not going to. Comp- I'm not going to agree with it. Everyone knows where they're tired is. And even if you run a mile or if I run a mile, I will become tired, which is one reason that I don't do it very often. Uh, um, but by the way, if I run a mile, I, I would collapse dead. So it's okay. <laughs> so if you want to know what your fear looks like, here's what you do. The next time you're in the train station, walk up to somebody and say, uh, hi, here's a $5 bill. Would you like to buy it for a dollar? Now, that, that's a great one. By every external measure, there is zero risk of this transaction, right? It's going to cost you four bucks, but it's not going to cause you to lose your job or anything else. So, why is it so hard to do that? Why is it so hard to walk up to a stranger and try to have a transaction with them that will clearly benefit them? Or to go to things that are far more generous, what happens if you go to a soup kitchen and not only volunteer to serve soup, but then spend the hour after lunch sitting with people who are not like you, looking them in the eye and asking them to tell you their story. Most people hesitate to do that for a whole bunch of complicated, rational, fearful reasons. So there are all these places we can go to dance with fear. And 
you know, my, my mantra of everyone should have a blog and everyone should blog every day is primarily because if you cajole yourself into speaking a truth, your truth, every single day on schedule, you will learn to dance with fear and you will be able to write until you are not afraid of writing anymore. And so how did you start doing this? How did you start 20 years ago, start going beyond where you were afraid? Well, so at the beginning, I knew that I had a desperate need to be self-employed, that my brushes with jobs made it clear that unless I had a very special boss, work in the traditional sense was going to make me very unhappy. And so I leapt into um, making stuff for the book industry because I thought it would be a fun uh, and possibly uh, lucrative, but not that lucrative way to make a living. Uh, the goal was never to make a big profit. It was just to be able to keep doing it. But then I discovered uh, probably five years into it that I was hiding from big projects. I was hiding from projects that felt like they might not work. I had been doing small, trivial stuff instead. And when I sold the Business Almanac, which was basically the internet in an 800-page book before there was a World Wide Web, it was a project that no human being could do by themselves. It was seven people working full-time in a room together with semi-custom software to write and typeset this mammoth book. And the whole time I was doing it, there was no certainty that it would work. And that feeling and the success that came from it became, for me, the thing I associated with doing important work. And so, so, so that was great that that was a success. What was a time where you went beyond where you started feeling fear and you totally failed? Like it just did not work and you were ashamed and embarrassed about it? Well, that was most of the time. Um, I, I, I'm not ready to give myself shame most of the time because I think that has a moral component to it. But, you know, when we were running Yoyodyne, the company that invented commercial email, uh, we had two big clients at one point, AOL, uh, the online service, and Carter Wallace, the people who made Arid Extra Dry deodorant. And we started, through a technical error, sending all the AOL uh, users, Arid Extra Dry promotion, and all the Arid Extra Dry deodorant users, AOL promotions. And we didn't do it once. We didn't do it twice. It felt like we did it three weeks in a row. And okay. the good news is the third time, it, we really didn't. I just thought we did. But yeah. it became clear to me that we had to buckle down and not be reckless in the way we were growing things because we were making promises to people. And... Well, why, why didn't AOL fire you after that? Oh, AOL not only fired me, they threatened to have me arrested. Oh, my God. And uh, it was a very, very bad cycle. It took us uh, another nine months to get back in sync uh, with AOL. And then I'll tell you a, a small story, which I have not uh, said out loud very often, about uh, what it is to make promises. So at that point, Yo-Yo Dine had grown to 50 people. And we got a contract to build something for AOL that would run in their chat rooms. Uh, we invented this idea of, of coming up with a profitable way uh, for AOL to change their chat rooms. And in those days, AOL was $3 an hour, and we negotiated a deal where we would get a 25% royalty. So for every hour people spent in our chat rooms, we were going to make $0.75, cents, and we were talking about millions and millions of hours a month. And we built this whole piece of software and it worked and it tested beautifully. And two days before we were going to launch it, AOL switched its pricing to flat rate pricing. And as a result, there were no royalties. As a result, they canceled the project. As a result, I had to look 50 people in the eye and say, I promised you we were onto something and we're not. And that fear is one of my deepest professional fears of making these promises to people you work with or to people you're delivering to and then not being able to keep them. Not do necessarily a failure of your own, but because that's the way the world works. And, and so, and, like, what did you do that night? Like, how did you deal with the stress and anxiety that that one 
thing. And as you say, it was out of your control, just like the world is naturally chaotic, but you still have to personally deal with it. What did you do? Um, well, you know, on an external level, it was about looking each and every person in the eye and taking as much responsibility and, and bringing as much compassion to the situation as I could because I find that hiding behind a bureaucracy and using uh, indeterminate pronouns does nobody any good. And then, of course, you've absorbed all of this and the question is what you do with it. And what works for me is to go for a walk that can be as long as is necessary but you don't finish the walk till you're done where you try to put this uh, combustion, this failure, this ending into perspective, which is that you only have two choices going forward. You can find a path where it will never happen again, which means you will never do anything important, or you can understand that getting back into it and delivering more value tomorrow is the single best way to deal with the fact you couldn't deliver enough value today. And did you have to lay off any employees? Uh, I am thrilled to say that we never had to lay off anybody from that project or most projects, um, but it was a very close, close thing. We were regularly within a week of missing payroll. At one point, we had to send our senior sales guy uh, uh, to our biggest client to collect a check because if we had waited one day for it to arrive by Federal Express, we would have uh, not been able to make payroll. And so, so, and I just want to, I, I think Yo-Yo Dine's interesting because it's one of those internet companies that got sold in the late 90s. You, you sold to Yahoo. You became director of marketing at Yahoo. Um, you know, what happened, you know, how did you, how did you basically sell the company? Like, how did Yahoo approach you? Like, what happened there? Um, it was, we were uh, raising another, a new round of money. And uh, someone we talked to said, why don't we just buy you instead? And word got back to Yahoo that their competitor was about to buy us. And um, that was enough for them to call me and say, so what's happening? And I said, well, I'm going to be in California tomorrow. Why don't we talk about it? So I flew out to California. And one of the lessons I had from that trip was they had a bulletin board next to the CEO's office. And there were only four articles on the bulletin board. One of the articles was an interview with me uh, in which I predicted that Yahoo's banner uh, sales were dramatically in danger because they were so overpriced. Hmm. And it was very controversial in those days to speak up as an insider and talk about the fact that one of your competitors was uh, basically creating a ceiling that was gouging people. Uh, And that taught me a lesson about speaking my truth, even if in the moment it might feel uncomfortable. That standing out in that situation and and standing for something, having a point of view, as opposed to saying, how do I fit in more and make more sales, is one of the things that got us onto Yahoo's radar. Um, And so fortunately, we were able to create a a really positive landing for a bunch of people. Uh, It wasn't a good fit for me, but I definitely gave it a try. Well, it's interesting that... Um, your point of view, as you say, it's almost was more valuable than all of your revenues and customers and so on. Like, and I think people miss that point. Like you have to sort of be out there so people can see you. Well, I guess I think that we all see some people who are out there to be seen who aren't also adding value. And when I say the word adding value, I mean, generosity in the sense that you are not doing it merely or even solely because you want to make a living. You are doing it because contributing to a community you care about is work worth doing in its own way. So that this podcast, you know, Milton Friedman would say, James, you're an idiot. The economic value of this podcast is ridiculous. And I think you could say this is a high leverage, inexpensive way for me to feed the community. And if you feed the community enough, everything's going to work out. I I think that's that's kind of been an important lesson that many successful people learn at some point, that you go from kind of a hoarding mentality to a giving mentality. I always use Google as an example. Google measures its success 
by how quickly people leave its website with the information they need. And so, so Google doesn't hoard any information. It just gives out freely. And that's the, the whole secret of their success. Well, I hope someone is listening because that used to be the secret of their success. It is not the secret of their success anymore. And they have been cursed by being a public company. I hope that uh, Google understands that uh, being the center of the community does not mean they have to be the whole community. Well, that's interesting. So, so what do you think – uh, wh- where do you think they've kind of veered away right now? Like, what is the secret of their success at the moment? Well, you know, because the ecosystem they have built is so complete between Gmail and Search and Mobile and Maps, uh, there's not a lot of danger that in any given moment their redirecting of people's attention is going to cause someone to quit Google because you really can't quit Google. Right. Um, and, and, that, and that means that they are now a, uh, they have to act like a statesman and say, we win when all of this works better, not when we get more clicks. So if you look, um, uh, Aaron Wall has put up a series of great posts about this. If you look at what Google search engine page results were like six years ago, you might see eight or ten uh, organic links of things you could go click on to leave. And now for many topics, there are none. For many things you search on, there is not one link that is not either to another Google page or that is paid for. And that's a really big shift um, because the only way to make the stock go up is to extract more value per user. And the way to extract more value per user, they are uh, theorizing, is to get people to stay throughout the whole thing. So you type in a hotel, you see their map, you see the reservation thing for which they earn uh, some income, and you've never left, right? And done perfectly, that works great. But what we see in almost every industry is when it becomes a monolith, things stop getting done perfectly. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, and it, it reminds me a little of your 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 old business Squidoo and and its model, where it was more curated to make sure that there was value per topic. Right, and when Squidoo worked the way it was supposed to, we desperately wanted people to leave our site. We weren't optimized to get people to stay because we understood that if people came and left. Uh, we were creating a series of breadcrumbs that would add value. We weren't, at, you know, we were the 40th biggest website in the U.S. We weren't the first biggest. And so the game was different for us, which was how do we uh, contribute as generously as we possibly can. And one of the challenges we had is we had 3 million users who were creating these pages and getting them all into sync was always a challenge because their objectives might be different than our objectives. So getting to your book, uh, you know, what to do when it's your turn. Uh, let's say someone's, um, you know, sitting in their cubicle at some company, Procter & Gamble, wherever, and they're looking at this and they're thinking, boy, I'd really like to, to break out of the shell. I'd really like to take my turn. But I have no idea what to do. I've just – I've been in the system for all these years or, or maybe they're not thinking this directly, but this is what they, what they are. Uh, where, where are their opportunities? How can they seek out their opportunities? Well, you know, if I was going to get really tactical, step by step, I would say, all right, tonight you were planning on going home and watching Girls and the Evening News, an hour and a half of television. Instead of doing that, let's remind ourselves that your passion is cricket or curling or some sport like that. Go build a curling blog and every day write something useful about curling. And then start organizing and coordinating the other people around your community or the world who are into curling. And start a curling association and a curling discussion board and put out new ideas into the world about how curling could be better. And just give up three hours a week of television to do this. And what you will find three months later is a whole network of people who are supporting you and cheering you on. The ability, the the realization that you know how to write the ability to change people's minds. And then the next thing you're going to do, I don't know, maybe you're going to start selling vintage curling uh, jerseys on Etsy and build a following as you do that. 
Or maybe it has nothing to do with the first thing you started. It's just that the next time you go to a meeting at P&G, instead of sitting around all the whole hour waiting for someone to take blame and responsibility, you will. You'll stand up and say, I'll take care of that because you know you can. Right, because you've been practicing. Exactly. And so you do that four times and the next thing you know, you're going to get invited to better meetings and have better snacks where there are better opportunities because P&G is desperate for people who will say, I'll take care of that. And your work becomes more meaningful. Your leverage goes up. And sooner or later, the phone rings because someone at this company down the street has heard about the ruckus you're making and wants you to come there instead. So not everyone wants to climb the corporate ladder, but I hope we're interested in climbing the ladder of meaningfulness, the ladder of generosity. And you get to do that if you are willing to say to people, follow me, as opposed to waiting to be told that this is on the test, waiting to be told it's okay to do the next thing. And I I like how I I saw you speak at at Google uh, about a year and a half ago, and I like how you... um, you know, address the writing every day thing. You said, you know, it's, you know, some people uh, complain about writer's block, but nobody ever complains about talker's block. So just even somebody talking about curling can just jot down what they were talking about and then they have a blog post. So it's really not, it's not like this huge hurdle to start blogging every day. Well, it's a huge hurdle to acknowledge to yourself that you are creating a permanent digital record of something you thought. Uh, A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people, you know, it's fascinating. If you uh, call up a call center, and I think call center employees are overworked, um, poorly respected, and underpaid. But if you call up a call center of any kind, after the recording that says this call is going to be recorded for quality, and say to the person who answers the phone, I am recording this call, the entire call is going to be different. Because the whole idea of thinking that you are on the hook is something we have been fighting against since we were five years old. And I am encouraging, and I think you are encouraging people to put themselves on the hook. Because when we do that, that's when we're going to do our best, most highly leveraged, most generous work. So I am just on a tear trying to get people to understand the huge opportunity they have to be on the hook. And I think it's a privilege. You know, it, and and you're right, it is scary. So I always tell people, I don't publish a blog post unless, um, unless by the time I finish writing it, I'm scared to hit publish. And I have no idea what's going to happen, but I usually find the more scared I am, the more... Uh, it somehow either touches people or, you know, unfor- unfortunately, in some cases, gets people angry. So, so I think it's very true. But it is. There's no denying that when, that fear is real, and it's not fun to overcome fear, even though it might be fun and interesting to see the outcomes of overcoming that fear. Like, it, like it's not like you don't get it, you don't get any rewards immediately for overcoming fear. All you are is scared and maybe a little depressed when when you're afraid. Well, let's think about the narrative here because if you've been skiing or snowboarding or to an amusement park when there are roller coasters or uh, any activity where people are paying money and time to experience something that seems frightening to others. And then, as you watch them get better, they keep upping the stakes, right? It's not enough to ski. Now you have to ski out of bounds, and you have to cat ski, and you have to heli ski, right? Well, we do those things because culturally we created a box to put them in. We call it adventure sports or whatever, right? And I'm arguing that it is possible to do something from an office chair, something from a podium, something at a keyboard that feels just as gratifying as the adrenaline we get from powder skiing, but that is actually contributing far more to the culture that we care about. And if you can put it in that box, it's not about surviving or pushing through the fear. It's about dancing with the fear. Yeah, I, uh, I really agree with that, um, particularly since I don't do any adventure sports. This, this podcasting is my adventure sport. So... Um, 
You know, I wanted to ask you, and this is a, a little off to the side, but you know, you did very well, obviously, with Yo-Yo Dying. You've done very well with your books. This is now what your 18th book, not counting the books you've you've packaged in the past. This is like what to do when it's your turn. I think is your 18th book that you've published. Right. Why do you keep doing it? And, and that might be the stupidest question ever, but I'm just curious. What what motivates you at this point? Yeah, it's not a stupid question at all. It's something I spend a lot of time working on, trying very hard to figure out my next project because it's probably not a book. Uh, you know, there are two questions you're asking. One, why books? And I think books have a magical power. They remind us of things from when we were little. They are self-contained. They are accessible. They last. They can be shared from person to person. They are an artifact that's been perfected over hundreds of years. I am thrilled that I get to make a book. So I love books to begin with. But then the second question is, why do any of this? Why not just go sit in Tahiti? And uh, for me, the work I do has never once been about making a profit. I just want to be able to keep doing the work because given a choice between getting paid $100 to sit still for an hour and do nothing, or getting paid a dollar to change somebody for the better, I would do the second one every time. Do, do you fear, that, yeah. do, you, do you personally fear for legacy? So you keep putting out there to, to almost like further cement the legacy you leave? You know, I am way past that. I decided uh, 10 years ago that I wanted to be judged by what the people who learned from me teach other people. And so now there's, you know, a million people teaching other people. So I'm off the hook <laughs> in terms of legacy. The other thing that's really clear to me, having studied uh, the people who came before me, uh, you know, privileged to be friends with Tom Peters, Zig Ziglar before he died, Jay Levinson was a partner before he died. It doesn't take very long after you're gone for you to fade from the conversation. Um, you know, I was listening to some Zig Ziglar last night. I don't think a lot of people were listening to Zig Ziglar on their audio last night. Um, what, what were you listening to specifically? Culture. Sorry? What were you listening to specifically? He did 72 hours of tapes. Um, that saved me for many, many years from quitting. Hmm. Uh, one on motivation, one on goal setting, one on selling. Uh, I strongly recommend them uh, and have been for a long time. Uh, but we, our culture now has such a short half-life that you say to someone, you know, on, on the door of my office, I've got a picture of uh, Bella Abzug, uh, Miles Davis, uh, and a few other people. And people say, who's that? And I say, Miles Davis. And they say, Miles who? Right? So... You know, the chance that any of us are going to be culturally immortal is pretty close to zero. And I'm not sure that racing around to try to change that is a worthy endeavor. So, so what, what, um, what books do you recommend? Given, that, given your love of books and your love of writing, what books do you recommend kind of the aspiring entrepreneur or, or those people who want to take their turn now, who are going to do what you suggest? Well, you know, for me, The War of Art is a key uh, Great cornerstone book. book. Uh, a book, The Gift by Lewis Hyde, is a breakthrough book that will make you think differently about a lot of things. Uh, a book most people have not read called The Republic of Tea uh, by uh, the founders of both that brand and the Banana Republic is a touchstone for me that I go back to now and then. Um, but I also think it's important to read... Uh, science fiction, everything from uh, Dune to the uh, to books like Snow Crash and the Diamond Age, because they teach you what happens if you just change one rule in the universe. How does the rest of everything go down? How does it change? Because that's what entrepreneurs do. They change one rule in the universe. Um, I think the Tom Peters Seminar and the Pursuit of Wow, two really underrated Tom Peters books, belong on everyone's desk. Uh, my friend Jackie Yuba has written a couple books that I think will change the way you think about customers. Uh, Pam Slim wrote a book called Escape from Cubicle Nation uh, that I would have you seek out. Amanda Palmer's new book on uh, the extraordinary power that comes from asking is really special. I, I just want to add that yeah. while we're doing this interview, her, I, I interviewed her a few weeks ago. Her podcast 
is being released today, like any any minute. The, the one that I did with her, and we didn't even practice that. We didn't practice that. <laughs> Very good. Um, I, I love that book I too. Hope, I hope people will read your book. Um, I Thank think you. that you know. No, I know that no one goes up to Steven Spielberg and says, "You should congratulate me. I finished all of ET. I sat through the whole movie." No one says that. But people act like they're doing the world a favor when they read a book. And, you know, I learned from Tom Peters, uh, who blurbs books like crazy. He said, look, the book costs 20 bucks. If I get one idea out of a book that changes my life, it's a bargain. And I believe that. So I, I read a few a day. I think, you know, if there's a library near you, go ahead and get them for free. The author gets nothing, but you get everything. But you need to read more books. You don't have to read the whole thing. You got to get the joke and move on. But they really do change the conversation. Well, Seth, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Uh, The book that you just came out with, What to Do When It's Your Turn, and It's Always Your Turn. You can't get this book on Amazon right now. Will Will you put it on Amazon eventually? I don't know. I'm really bad at that kind of plan. We'll see. <laughs> so you can, but you can, you can get it at your turn dot link, which I encourage people to do. Um, plus, I encourage people to read all your other books because it's been fascinating to see the the evolution of your ideas bit by bit uh, over the past 15 years. So it's it's been really great. Well, so, thank you, James, and I'll be back in 15 more years to talk about what's next. <laughs> great. I'll talk to you soon, Seth. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Building a stronger financial foundation? Good plan. Northwestern Mutual's Guide to Good Financial Planning can help you balance spending and saving, set goals, and start creating the life you want to be living. You'll learn how the tools in your financial plan reinforce each other to help you minimize taxes and offset potential risks. Grow your confidence by strengthening your finances today at northwesternmutual.com slash good plan. The Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin.